we're going to talk about Book of Mormon and the Jews, of course, in the light of the new discoveries. I mentioned the Copper Scroll and said they're very faint where you can see this. This is about, it's bigger, they're bigger than this, but um, you can see, well, some examples here. There's a typical page, you see. The, uh, the leaves go that way, and here are the holes along here, and they put them together. And this is what they say. They have given us the text here, which is very clear and legible. Though, see, it's, it's painfully etched in the, pressed into the, in the copper. Remember, the Book of Mormon record keepers always complain, not always, but often complain about the difficulty of writing on this difficult medium with, uh, with their hands. They hate to do it. And so we have it here. Well, this is typical. It starts out, it's very intriguing. It sounds like a mystery or something like this. Item number one here. In the fortress, which is in the Vale of Achar, 40 cubits under the steps, they've given us a transliteration and translation here, 40 cubits under the steps, entering to the east, a money chest, and its contents, a weight of 17 talents. Now, that's a lot of money buried there. Here's another one. In the trough of the palace basin, the tithe vessels consisting of the log vessels. See, the sacred vessels, they hid them too, so the Romans wouldn't get them. And for of all the tithes stored for the seventh year produce, the second tithe from the mouth of the opening, the bottom of the water conduct, six cubits from the north toward the hewn immersion pool. They cleverly buried that under the swimming pool, so nobody would guess that that's where it was, and that is under the floor of the pool. And these are very clever places where they hid this stuff. Of course, you don't know how to locate them today. Uh, in the underground passage, which is in the court, a wooden barrel inside a bath measure of untithed goods, 70 talents of silver. It's a lot, too. It goes on and on like this. In the cistern, which is 19 cubits in front of the eastern gateway, in it are vessels and a hollow that in it, that in it has 10 talents. And then it has some uh, a Greek code letter writing on it. And here's place we talk Well, it goes on. But the ones that are most interesting, of course, the ones where it tells us there are records buried, that there are documents which they preserved, just exactly as Lehi's people were careful to preserve them. Uh, Here's more temple stuff. In the court of blank blank, nine cubits under the southern corner, gold silver vessels for the tithe, sprinkling basins, cups, sacrificial bowls, libation. Remember, in the caves we looked at, we might as well pass this thing around. It's the way we do in school. Here's this is the one you know about Bar Kokhba. There's a bag, perfectly preserved bag, just kind of get in Mexico today with, with keys and vessels and kitchen tools in it. And you can look at the stuff there, just to toss it around. Uh, and then, of course, we're not going to spend any time on this, just to show you what we have. And the interesting thing here, you see, here it is, and they're kept on these, this is the way it was found originally, can't see it from there, they're kept on these copper rolls, but the rolls were originally plates like this, and then they were riveted together and rolled up uh, to be hidden with the other rolls, easier to handle that way, yes? When we read brass in the Old Testament or in the Book it's of Mormon, bronze, yes. we're supposed to read bronze. Well, you can read bronze. They didn't make well brass is they didn't have brass, the the uh, alloy of copper and nickel, but of course copper and tin was much commoner. And uh, see, the word brass, bronze doesn't occur in the in our Bible at all, King James, because it wasn't used until the 1880s. It wasn't an English word at all. It was a French word. See, we used brass. Brass means bronze. All I do is drop the n, but. Uh, in the King James Version, when we know it means bronze, they always say brass because the word bronze was not used, not only in the 17th century, it wasn't used even to the middle of the 19th century. They weren't using In Joseph Smith's time, they didn't use the word bronze at all. That was a word for artists in Paris to use. And it was a new thing, but everything was brass. And that's what you mean when you say brass. Brass or bronze, it's a copper alloy, and that's what this is too. This is not pure copper. But the, uh, and here's one in it, them figured coins. And, uh, these are very well hidden, you must say. In the inner chamber of the platform of the double gate facing east, the northern entrance, buried three cubits deep, hidden under it is a pitcher, in it one scroll, and under it 42 talents. So they were hiding their documents too here, you see. And uh, How many of these things have they recovered? None of them. They don't know where these things were. They've looked for some. They might blunder on some as far as that goes, but the, the, pic the scene has changed considerably, you see. It's like to go into San Francisco now after the earthquake and try to find something. Here's another one, see. Well, now, how, where would you look for this? In the drain pipe, which is in the eastern path to the treasury, which is beside the entrance, tithe jars and scrolls among the jars. 
and in the stubble field of the Chave, facing southwest, in an underground passage, looking north, buried at 24 cubits, and that's way down there, you see. Uh, that's uh, 30, 36 feet, you see, 24 plus 12, yes. It's 36 feet deep in a field. Well, you start looking for it and see if you can find it. Dig 36 feet here, there, and everywhere, and so it goes. In the funnel, we don't know what that is. In the pipe, in the water pipe that runs to the basin of the drain, buried seven cubits under the toilet. Well, there it is, you see. Nicely hidden, the last place people wanted to mess around. find <laughs> <laughs> these things. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, now, did I put my, where's my thing here? Of course, we, oh, so much for the copper scroll here. And uh, we have to get on now. And, um, what we were talking about. Did I bring... Of course I didn't. Well, that's all. I never do. Oh, yeah, here it is. Just think. Yes, now, that book by Kochba that's going around there, this is very important. The theme is here, Out of the Dust. And it's a Book of Mormon motif that's very clear. This would mean a lot to the Jews, you see, is as far as this goes. And Professor Yadin... Now, Professor Yadin's been here a number of times. I say we spent some very fascinating evenings with him because he's a great talker and he was the commander in the 1948 war and tells us the narrow escapes they had and so forth. Quite a story. But he was the one in charge of that dig and he says, the Israeli scholars are understandably moved. I'll make these documents. He says, we found that our emotions were a mixture, mixture of tension and awe. Yet the, oh, I'm going to put this on reserve. I, I found another copy of it, so I'm going to have some Xeroxes made and put it on reserve. It's a review of his book. Uh, Yet astonishment and pride at being part of the reborn state of Israel after a diaspora of 1,800 years. See, remember what the Lord tells us in the 24th chapter of Matthew in the Pearl of Great Price? This is going to be the number one scattering of the Jews, worse than any persecution they'd ever known before or after. And this was it. Of course, 1,800 years of being non-persons, having no privileges, no protection, whatever, was a terrible time. And this, this is the way Nephi puts it. That's the way... Professor Yadin puts it, and said, And it shall be as if the fruit of thy loins had cried out unto them from the dust, for I know their faith, they shall cry from the dust, even after many generations have gone by them. And see the picture of the caves there in dust up to their ears there, because these things were actually buried under the dust. They weren't, they weren't just left there casually. These things were buried. That these documents are buried. And that's important, you see. And still being able to read them on the spot, Yadin said, oh, Well, Nephi here is talking here. They were able to pick them up. You can just read them right off. And that's what they did. And for those, Second Nephi says, For those who shall be destroyed shall speak unto them out of the ground, and their speech shall be low out of the dust. Their voice shall be as one that hath a familiar spirit. For the Lord God will give him power, that he may whisper concerning them, even as it were, out of the ground. And their speech shall whisper out of the dust. Well, that's exactly the effect you have here. They were absolutely awed, over overwhelmed, when they could read these records of their own ancestors, open them and read them as if they'd been written the day before. These texts were deliberately buried. The people who left these records died soon after they buried them and died on the spot, the victims of a savage religious war. Second Nephi 26 and 16 says, For those who shall be destroyed shall speak unto them out of the ground. What do these records contain? These records in these caves, these are the cave of documents. See the caves you find from the 70 BC, from the earlier destruction, uh, you find up north at Qumran, well, and all around there anyway, uh, are doctrinal. They're full of doctrine, so forth, as we'll see. But these are the accounts of their doings and their, their business records and so forth, and there are a lot of them. And so we read again in Second Nephi 26. Well, there are documents, military and civil correspondence, the words of Mormon, uh, or in the words of Mormon, For thus saith the Lord God, they shall write the things which shall be done among them. Therefore, those who have been destroyed have been destroyed speedily. Of course, they, in one night, they were wiped out. They didn't, the Romans didn't even bother to go in the caves. They didn't bother to go over there at all. They knew they couldn't escape. And they just died in the caves. Terrible thing. Not only all their letters and legal papers, but their household effects and their bones were left behind in the caves. As to the destroyers, says Yadin, nothing remains here today of the Romans save a heap of stones on the face of the desert. But here the descendants of the besieged are returning to salvage their ancestors' precious belongings. And again, Second Nephi tells us, and the multitude of their terrible ones shall be as chaff that passeth away. The enemy just disappear. That happened to the Romans, and so it goes. And we have the story here of the fighters under Bar Kokhba. 
or in the Book of Mormon in terms between Lehi and the refugees in the desert and Moroni the hero fighting against fearful odds to save his people because Bar Kokhba was of course the hero and we have his letter we have letters actually signed by him from these caves not just a, a story book cop was preserved in Greek cast down through the Middle Ages turned up in Warsaw somewhere in a ghetto uh, in a printed version from the 17th century that's the way we usually get stuff you know but this is this is the original the original documents and the armies of mighty world conquering powers determined to hold Palestine and subdue the Jews for that purpose. In Lehi's day, well, we tell about the rich lady ba Babata and so forth, and the, uh, and the metal objects, the, the practice of fleeing to these caves is far older than Lehi's day, and of course, this comes seven centuries after Lehi's day. But we know they were doing it 3,000 years before, going to these same caves, bringing their household effects, storing their valuable temple vessels and so forth in these caves. They've been doing it all. It's the usual practice, and so the Lord tells them, when the abomination of desolation comes, then flee to the mountains and don't turn back. You stay there. And he says, it's going to be worse than any the collections of writings. And uh, then, the autograph of Bar Kokhba himself. Bar Kokhba's people reissued Roman coins with slogans of liberty resembling those on the trumpets in the armies of the battle scroll from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Such devices are year of redemption of Israel, year of freedom of Israel, or freedom of Jerusalem. Notice they use the word freedom a great deal. That sounds modern. They say, well, that's Joseph Smith. He got it from his American background and so forth. Don't worry. These people that fled from Jerusalem to save themselves, Lehi among them, that's really did it. Remember what they tell Zoram? Come down to us where we are in the desert and you shall be a free man if you come and join us. And so it is here with that. Com uh, and compare this with Moroni's standards in memory of our God, our religion, our freedom, our peace, our wives, our children, and so forth. And uh, talk about the title of liberty and the like here, the cave of letters. And we talk about Alma, son of Judah, and here's a very interesting thing. During the war, this is, this is a correspondence between Bar Kokhba and the general commanding up north, he says. Uh, Bar Kokhba had to deal with just such characters as those Alma had to deal with, and he did it in the same way. To the brothers, for he calls them his brothers, as Moroni always calls them his brothers when he writes his letters. In the city of Ain Gedi, that's the town along the coast of ways up there, you know, <coughs> Oh, it's only, well, I mean, from the cave of letters, it's just uh, a half hour walk. He personally wrote a letter in Hebrew that survives to this day, to Masabala and to Yehonathan Barbiani, peace. In comfort, you sit eating and drinking from the property of the house of Israel and care nothing for your brothers, thus Shadin says. And so we read in Alma writing in 60 to Pahoran in the city of Zarahemla and also to those who have been chosen by this people to govern and manage the affairs of this war. Can you, fit to sink, can you think to sit upon your thrones in a state of thoughtless super, stupor while your enemies are spreading the work of death around you? Yea, while they are murdering thousands of your brethren. Remember, Bar Kokhba had written, has written after that. He says, Tumas, notice, Tumas Bala, the writer, in comfort you sit eating and drinking from the property of the house of Israel and care nothing for your brothers that are dying in the war. Alma says, to Paharan in the city of Zarahemla, can you fit to sink, sit upon your thrones in a state of thoughtless stupor, notice, and care nothing, he says in thoughtless stupor here, while the death, they, while they're murdering thousands of your brethren. The same situation, and the same answer too. Alma was, uh, this wasn't Alma, right? of course, this was Moroni, but uh, and the answer was that Moroni was wrong, that Baharun hadn't betrayed, and he, he had been driven out actually himself. The, the crowd, uh, the, the crooked crowd had taken over the government, and he was in, he was in hiding himself. And so it was misunderstood. Uh, and so uh, the same thing happens here. Exactly. He says, why haven't you brought help to us? Moroni said, remember, he accused Baharun of withholding supplies, and thus Galgula, the leader, uh, another leader, Galgula, was called to task by, by Bar Kokhba for holding out supplies, including a cow. And he wrote to his, his superiors, and here was his answer to Bar Kokhba. He says, we haven't been sitting on our thrones idle. Were it not for the Gentiles, meaning the Romans, who are near us, I would have gone up and satisfied you concerning this, lest you say that it is out of contempt that I did not come to you. And Moroni, Moroni ran into just such a situation with Pahoran where he said, it is of those who have taught to take away the judgment seat from me that have been the cause of this great iniquity. They have withheld our provisions, they have daunted our freemen, that they have not come to you. In your epistle you have censured me, but it mattereth not, I am not angry. Notice, they have been responsible. They have withheld our provisions and have daunted our freemen that they have not come 
unto you. And of course, the, the Roman writes to Galgula, the commander writes to Bar Kokhba, were it not for the Gentiles who were near us, I would have gone up and satisfied you concerning, yes, you say that out of contempt, I did not go to you. He said, you withheld our provisions, the cow, and so forth. So it comes, well, they're almost too close. It would be a damning circumstance if, we, if these things had been found after the Book of Mormon came out. You'd know where Joseph Smith got them all alone, uh, were found before. Well, the explanation would be found in the Jewish people here. The, uh, we talk about the deeds. But leave us get on to this, the situation here. Now, from this article of Golbs, I put this on reserve. You know this one? Who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls? Did I talk about this one? Yeah, we mentioned it. Well, but uh, the, uh, the picture he gives us, you know, what you have, the whole length, the whole length of the Dead Sea here, you have the, uh, go down here. Oops, let me come up here. This is the Lishan. That's getting very shallow now. You can walk right across there. It's a dry year. And here's the Jordan here. And here's Qumran. And here's En Gedi. And here's the cave where they found the scrolls and so forth. All along here. And here's Masada down here. 30 miles down here. And here's Qumran. These deposits were made in the year 70 when, when uh, Vespasian was, the Romans were besieging the city. And then the Jews were driven out, but they came back and settled. And, uh, more tr and then they revolted under Bar Kokhba, under this Bar Kokhba, and uh, they were beaten, finally, and uh, then they were banished from ever coming back to Israel again. They could never come back to Jerusalem again. After 130, no Jew could be found uh, in, it was a death sentence to be found in Jerusalem. So the Jews are out there. And they moved to Pella, up, up here a ways. It's in Jordan now. The, they're still excavating there. They've got all sorts of stuff there. But that's, that's where the earliest Jewish settlement was. And then, uh, but this is what happens. You see, they're moving out of Jerusalem, and here's Jerusalem right here. But they move on a broad front. You find here the case Murabaat, thousands of documents here, 500 to 800 different texts. They move here, they move here, they move all around Massive, they move down to farms down here, they move down to the Nabataean country, and they leave documents all along here from the whole period. And comparing those, these aren't the documents just of some little sect, which, as Pliny says, were only 4,000 people. These represented the prevailing Judaism at Jerusalem before the rabbis took over. Now, let me just tell you the story of Yohanan ben, ja ben Zakkai as to how Yohanan ben Zakkai. In, uh, remember, in the time of Lehi, in 587, Nebuchadnezzar took Jerusalem and took the Jews back to Babylonia. Well, what didn't they have anymore? They didn't have a temple anymore. But the doctors carried on. They had their own school, and they didn't have a temple, but they, most of the doctors were glad to see the temple gone because they didn't hold any priesthood, you see. They were just learned men. The Book of Mormon has marvelous comments on what they do. He says, remember, they were always looking beyond the mark, too smart for their britches. They will argue all, they will argue in three volumes about one verse and so forth. They love to do that, love to split hairs. They'll argue with you. They'll uh, cavil on the tenth part of a hair and uh, a straw. And the... Uh, so the doctors carried on in the school of Pumbadefa in Babylonia, and you had the masters of the two great schools there who presided over the, uh, over the prince of the captivity. When, when he, the prince was, was inaugurated and crowned, they had their own prince there and so forth. But the, school, the two schools dominated everything. When they came back to Jerusalem, they continued to function. See, the learned man, and they weren't, they weren't priests. They didn't, didn't operate in the temple. But the temple under Nehemiah was rebuilt, you see. So you have in Jerusalem, at the, during this time, you have these two bodies. Well, when Vespasian was, dis, was uh, was uh, besieging Jerusalem in the year 70, Ben Zakkai was head of the schools there, not of the temple, but of the schools. And there was a fa the Romans blockaded the city, and as at Masada, there was a famine. And the, and the people were dying like flies. And Ben Zakkai wanted to rescue the people. He said, if we go out and make a, a concession with the Romans, then they'll let us go. Uh, we can make a deal with them, and we'll at least save our lives. But the famous zealots, uh, under, who were led by Ben Zakkai's own brother-in-law, who was called Abba, Abba, uh, Abba Saka, uh, Abba Sakara, yes, Abba Sakara. The, they were the Sakari, they were the Roman, at all times in the Roman Empire, 
there were the terrorists. They were known as the Sicarii. A Sicarius is a short knife, a Sicane in, in uh, Semitic language, in Greek and so forth. Uh, a short knife that you hold under your, that you can keep hidden under your robe or under your shirt or something like that. And the Sicarii went around with these knives and were in a, in a crowd, and there were great crowds in those days, uh, in a crowd, they could knock somebody off and slip away in the crowd and never be caught. And they, they were uh, an institution such as you find in the Book of Mormon, the Gadians. So they got away with him. He was the head of the Sicarii, and they were the zealots. And they had sworn that they would not allow anybody to make any concessions to the Romans at all. Anyone who did so should be a traitor. Well, he was the brother-in-law of, uh, of uh, Ben Zakai. Ben Zakai came to him and said, what do we do? These people are dying. Uh, how can I get out of the city? If I could only talk with Vespasian, I could make a deal with him. Well, uh, Ben uh, Abbasakari said, I'm going to make a, I'll, I'll allow it this time, but how are you going to get out of town? Well, yeah, they had a plan. His students announced, uh, Ben Zakai's students announced for several days that he was very ill and then he got sicker. Then it was announced that he was dead. And so he climbed into a coffin, perfectly healthy. <laughs> they were carrying him out of the gate, but the Zakari were guarding the gate and wouldn't allow anyone to, to, to leave at all. They would make no concessions. You can't go out and join the Romans. You can't surrender. You can't leave. So they say, who's going there? And they say, well, it's the, the head of the schools. It's the, it's the great Ben Zakai, he said. And uh, they said, well, we have to do the usual thing. Well, they, they always put a spear into people going out to make sure they were really dead and they weren't just trying to get out of the city. And they, the students raised an uproar. Do you mean to say that you will abuse the great prince of the schools here? And so they let him go out. As soon as he was out, he went and to see the emperor Vespasian. He was introduced, he was quite famous. Vespasian knew about him. Vespasian was quite a, was a very shrewd, very honest, and quite a kind man. One of the best emperors they ever had. And, uh, and he, he went into the emperor and he said, Hail, hail uh, Vespasian's emperor. Not Malik, he called him. Hail Vespasian Malik, king, emperor. Vespasian said, you must be mistaken. I'm not a king or emperor. He says again, today you will be emperor, hail Vespasian emperor. And as they were talking, a messenger came in all out of breath and announced that Vitellius had died and that the Senate had chosen Vespasian to be emperor, right there. So then he was willing to grant Ben Zakai anything he wanted. He says, what do you want? What can I grant you? Well, he asked a very simple thing. He says, grant me that I and my students, Tamadim, may leave the city and go over the Jordan and find a school at Jamnia a first rabbinical school, which they did. It's written various ways. And found a school at Jamnia, and they did, and Jerusalem was destroyed, and the temple was destroyed, and never rebuilt, and the rabbis were glad to see it go. There were too much in competition. I say they had no priesthood, and they, they argued about the temple and so forth. So this was, became the rabbinical schools. And this was, became normative Judaism. It's the rabbis have been deciding what is Judaism and what isn't. But what were they teaching before then? What were they teaching before 70? And that's what we find in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's not, I say, it's very clear that it's not just the, the teachings of some little sect in the desert, but this represented on this broad front, these people retreating by the thousands, bringing these documents. They tell us what was really being taught by the Jews in the time before the fall of Jerusalem. And here's where we check with the Book of Mormon, because these writings have been very unpopular. They, I notice I had some articles here. I attached to this one. The, uh, I say Allegro himself, he lost his job at Oxford because he pointed out in, 19, in 1960 that from 1950 to 1960 the, so, uh, the scrolls were suppressed. And they say we had, uh, we had here teaching uh, a few summers ago uh, Joseph Fitzmaier, the foremost Dead Sea Scrolls, incidentally my daughter's teaching along with him now uh, as a teaching assistant at Catholic University, of all things. She's a medieval, but she loves Middle Ages, so the only place you can get it is Catholic University, so there she is. But anyway, uh, Joseph Fitzmaier, who is the foremost Catholic scholar on the scrolls, says not 5% of them have been translated. They wouldn't touch him with a 40-foot pole, and we know from visits here, the temple scrolls, and well, I have to show you some of these anyway. I'm not going to talk about them, but here, are just some Xeroxes of scrolls. These are not the original scrolls, you understand. Uh, here is the, uh, the Enoch scroll. It wasn't published till 1976. And the week it was published, the, the, uh, it was published by Oxford, and Father Millick and Matthew Black were the ones, and Matthew Black did the English version of Father Millick's. <laughs> Matthew Black was here, and we had a great time. He was here a week, the very time this came out. 
And uh, he was completely bowled over by Joseph Smith's book of Enoch. See? He always said, well, I, I'll find a, we'll explain that someday, someday, someday something will turn up that explains. He had some sort of source, you see, of course he didn't. Joseph Smith said, we can't go into this. Well, there's the Enoch scroll anyway, very valuable. But I see it was withheld for 20 years. Everybody was scared to death of it. Father Millick had it. Here's the Mil Milhama scroll, here's the battle scroll. And uh, see, I have the photographs of the text here. No, this is a transliteration of the text. This is the battle scroll. And here you find the order of battle, which you don't find in the Bible. And of course, there are long accounts. There are 114 pages of wars in the Book of Mormon. So you can check up on strategy, tactics, and all the rest of it there very nicely. Here's the Zadokite fragment. This is what happened. These people, can't go into this today, see, and we can get the, uh, the photographs of them. This is a Zadokite fragment. These were found in the Damascus. This is called the Damascus Covenant. These were found in Damascus, and they were found in a, um, in the wall there, in a Geneza, where you can find these. Won't go into what a Geneza is. But see, the Zadokites, they were another group that ran off after they left. See, the Romans came and drove them out, just as they drove Alma out of his wilderness place. They drove them out of Qumran. And then they migrated on up to Damascus and carried on up there. So we have scrolls from Damascus, too, carried from the people of Jerusalem, spread all over the place. And then farther out in the desert at a place called Rakim, there was another settlement of them, which I visited and, and wrote up in the, the uh, Revue de Qumran some years ago. And uh, so you find them all over the place here. And so that's the Zadokite fragment. And it's, these people really belong down at Qumran and so forth. Here's the Hodiot scroll, the Thanksgiving scrolls, the hymns of praise, but they are biographical of certain prophets and teachers, and it's the story of Alma, and it's the story of Abinadi. They're matched, they're parallel right down the line, including their churches in the wilderness being driven out and so forth, and the rules they make and all that sort of thing. Here's the Genesis Apocrypha, the found in Cave One, the first one found. It's, this was edited by Father Fitzmaier himself. Uh, found in uh, cave number one, and uh, it's the story of Abraham in Egypt that fills in all the blanks that aren't found in the Bible. There are 11 chapters in the Bible about Abraham that doesn't have these stories, but our book of Abraham has them. The story of Abraham and Sarah with Pharaoh and so forth, so there we are again. And here is the most valuable of all. It didn't come out till 1977. It again was edited by Yigel Yadin, and uh, we, ha we were visited by various people, by, by, uh, by Rabbi, uh, uh, what's his name from Berkeley? And from Israel was uh, Kaplan, Abraham Kaplan, the foremost authority on the temple. See, they're going to rebuild the temple, <coughs> but they're scared to death of it. The uh, Kaplan was here, and Milgram that's from, from Berkeley was here. They're very good friends of ours. I mean, Milgram is a rabbi and professor of Hebrew at Berkeley, and, and, uh, and uh, Kaplan is from, from Israel. And they both tell us that they're very much frightened. They're, they're frightened by, well, in fact, three years ago, I, I was invited, rather commanded, back to Washington, D.C., where they had a big, a big powwow among the Christians, the Jews, the Catholics, and everything about the rebuilding of the temple. What are the Jews going to do about it? And, uh, but they were frightened, as they say, of, because of two things. The first is, who's going to be in charge? Because according to the temple scroll here, and this is a long one. See, here's the scroll. It goes on, it's the longest of all. It's about 68 feet long. It goes on and on and on. Unfortunately, it was hidden under a floor in Kando's grocery store up in Jerusalem, and so this part was rotted away by water. But there it is, as plain as day, and it describes what the Jews do in the temple. And it's not the temple you find in the Old Testament. It's our temple, very close. But the things that are worried them, not identical, you can well understand that, but the things that worried them were, uh, who's going to be in charge? Because this says the Levites, not the Kohanes are in charge, and that's going to mean trouble. And the other is, when we get the thing built, what are we going to do in it? Uh, they come to us to find out <laughs> what you do in a temple. And uh, I say, here's the fork, you know, the K4 Enoch. And so it goes. These st scrolls are really something you see all of a sudden. But I think they're best of all for the Book of Mormon. And, uh, oh, I say, here's Vermes, the foremost Roman Catholic scholar, the impact of the Dead Sea Scrolls on Jewish studies during the last 25 years. That was in 1975 and 76, before this suppressed stuff came out. And at that time, they were suppressing it. Well, as I say, here's uh, uh, Rudolf Meyer writing the same. The present uh, condition of was 1976. Uh, 
And he says, notice this, he's writing in November 1976 in the uh, Theologische uh, Literaturzeitung, and he says, it's clear by this time, 1970, that interest has vanished in the scrolls. How very interesting. <laughs> they dropped them like a hot potato before they even looked very far in them. The Christians didn't like them because they were too Jewish. The Jews didn't like them because they were too Christian. And we'll see why presently. The, uh, yeah, we have some time. And he says, quoting, it is clear that the Hochflut, that the high, that the high flood, high tide, in the discussion of Qumran has long ago been withdrawing and and the, and the tide has gone out again. He says, that, well, there's no loss there. He's glad to see it go. Because what we should do now is for a time and to engage in intensive studies on details which have been completely overlooked. All people are doing have been generalizing and really got nowhere. And uh, so we get these various people telling us that the, as I say, Allegro, that they did everything to suppress them. They actually did suppress it. And the fightings about them and so forth. Uh, uh, I had the field all to myself in 1964 when the, uh, the Jerusalem Museum, the Palestine Museum, which was in Jordan, not in Jerusalem at that time, was entirely deserted. And, and as I, I said, jo I had Joseph Saad all to myself. He was the director of the whole, the whole operation. For the, you see, the Rockefeller Foundation supplied the funds, but they, they had to have committees of, of uh, Christian Protestants, Catholics, Greek Catholics, and Jews on the committee to interpret these, and they, and they farmed out the various scrolls to different groups to get them out, and most of them delayed for as much, well, the, the Enoch scroll and the Temple scroll for as much as 27 years. They refused to let them out. He had the scroll in his possession for 27 years, and he didn't want to let it out. He had and did, and so and so did uh, did Millick. Millick was worried about. It. They were worried about these things, but now we get them. So let's see what they say. That's about the best thing we can do now. Uh, the IQS here. I have it. Yeah, here we are. Now the first in the first cave, they found. This is a very important one. The Serex scroll. The uh, Sakara. It's called one Roman one cave one. You see when you see that cave one Qumran. Serek, Serek meaning the opening words are, it's a doctrine and covenants is what it is. Serek, it means the order of the church. The Serek is the order of it. And this is the Serek scroll. And uh, so the what? Oh, might as well spell it out, the Serek. Well, this is called the Manual of Discipline when it was first found. Uh, what's his name from uh, Vincent called it the Manual of Discipline. Oh, what is it, my friend? It, and usually it was written the MS, just like the Damascus fragment and so forth. But Serek is, is the order. That's what they call it now, because that's what the Hebrews call it, the Serek scroll. Now, isn't it lucky, though? What a, what a break. If we hadn't found this, we'd still be wondering to this day what this could all possibly be about. But in the very first cave they opened, there were seven jars against the wall, and these seven jars were manuscripts. And in this, manus in this was manuscript that says, that is the explanation of what the whole thing is about. This tells us the order of the church, why these people are here, what, they, what their object is in coming out here, and so forth. These particular people, and it's not sectarian here, this is a very interesting thing, why they have come out here, and these records have been hidden, but they were written in Jerusalem now, not written out here apparently, as, as Gold says. That the scriptorium wasn't a scriptorium, it only had two desks and one ink bottle, and that was it. No pens or anything like that. Now, what year were these was, written? These were written, uh, the scrolls run from all, from the second century B.C. to the first century. These we can date from the coins and so forth that were found around, nothing later than 70 A.D. The ones down south now, the one I was talking about found in the dust and so forth, they come 132, the same thing, because uh, the Jews came back and tried to make a go of it again. But the temple, they didn't have a temple then. It was all gone, you see, and they're, they're not going to get it back again. But this is what they were out doing, and uh, this came first of all, you see, this was printed in, in uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, quite exciting how they got it, St. Mark's Monastery. The building where it was, the monastery, was bombed and completely destroyed about an hour after it was taken out of there. Otherwise, we would never have known what was going on here. Yes, it was Millar Burroughs, he's the one that gave it the title of the Manual of Discipline, and John C. Triver and Brownlee, the Trevor's at Claremont now, where I used to be. Well, anyway, and it was published in New Haven, 1951. This is just as they came up. It was discovered in 47, 
uh, and uh, by the boy. But then they were went from hand to hand. There was big arguments as to who belonged to them. <laughs> all sorts of fights, all sorts of fun put up, trying to grab them and so forth. Millions of dollars offered for them. Who was to get them? The Christians or the Jews? The St. Mark's Monastery had them first. They were taken there, <laughs> and they were smuggled around. And the person you have to deal with to get anything in the scrolls is a sly Greek by the name of Kando, who operates a, a drugstore in, in, in Bethlehem. And you have to deal with Kando. And this, this temple scroll, he, had a, he has an establishment in Jerusalem, too, was hidden under the floor of his place in Jerusalem, where, unfortunately, it was uh, exposed to groundwater, which destroyed the whole top half. It's 28 feet long is what this scroll is. <laughs> and it's all about the temple. Well, this one is about temple, too. It's about everything else. But I say, it starts out by saying, uh, this is the uh, Sefer Serach, and it breaks in. You see, it is the uh, very clear, very clearly written. They copy it, and they've obligingly, they've obligingly uh, transliterated on the other side. There's no translation here, uh, so we're going to have to see what it says. And it says, uh, "This is the Sefer Serach. This is the book of rules, the book of ordinances, doctrine and covenants." You see, for Hayachat uh, of the Church, Lidrash for the teaching of blank, 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 which, which shall be done those who intend to do good and, uh, and to return from evil. Lifne, uh, Kasher, before the face of God, before his face starts out, as has been commanded by the hand of Moses and by the hand of all the holy prophets. Incidentally, that, that use is by the hand of, is a Book of Mormon use, again, that you won't find in the Bible in this sense, a thing that um, uh, we have been rescued by the hand of something or other, something that made a lot of people laugh about the Book of Mormon, using it by the hand of business. So this is what it comes, this is what it is, and it starts out by telling us that this is the Book of the Rules. There is a supplement to this called the First QSA. That's this one here. And this has the, the beginning complete that was damaged in the other ones, and it starts out by saying, and this is the order of all the assembly of Israel in the latter days. When they gather together to form a church, the Asefam La Yachad. Now, Yachad, the word they use for church, the Catholic Austrian uh, George Molin wrote the first. Catholic book on the Dead Sea Scrolls, and this name, Yahad, they call themselves by, it's usually translated the unity, the community. Yahad means the one, you see. But Yahad, because it's the oneness, like the oneness of Zion. But he analyzes it and says the, the best word we can use for it is church. And the best name we can call these people, because we just had right here, is uh, Latter-day Saints. Unfortunately, he says, this title has been preempted by a certain sect. And so we can't use it, he said. <laughs> but if you wanted to know what the, the Dead Sea Scrolls people call themselves, it was Latter-day Saints. And they did. This is what it says. It starts out here, I think. When, the, when they shall be gathered together in the last days. Yeah. To walk according, notice this language they use, to walk according to the ordinances. This is the very Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenant sort of language. According to the Mishpat of the sons of Zadok. Now, well, Zadok is the same word as Melchizedek. See, Zadok is the priest Zadok. It means the righteous one. Mel Melchizedek means the king of righteousness and so forth. So they had not only the sons of Aaron, Aaron, but they also, in the last days, they were going to have the ordinances of the Bnei Zadok, of the sons of Zadok. And that's why that one from, from Damascus is also called the Zadokite fragment, because they called themselves Zadokites, of the higher priesthood of Zadok. And uh, I say, now we know that it belongs south. They'd come from Jerusalem, too. And then they, they went over to the east. They, they scattered everywhere. And the Mandaeans, still going today, are descendants from these Dead Sea Scrolls people. Uh, well, we may return to this uh, Serac scroll, because it has a very interesting thing to say here. But let's see what, oops, I'm going to have to go faster than this. So this says that, and it starts out here. And it says, and I don't know. When they come here, they shall bring all their dachat, all their mind, with all their koach, all their physical strength, and all their chon, and all their property, and give it to the Church of God. That's the Church of the, the, the Yahad El. And uh, for various reasons and so forth. And then they're here for a testing. Uh, this is, incidentally, this part we're reading here at the beginning here, this is what they're, uh, 
they hold a meeting. Anyone who comes and joins, they have a general meeting until a, number, a crowd has come, and they all assemble them together, and they read them this, and they make their covenants and so forth. It's just like the temple. They give them an introductory talk, and this is it. And then they have the ordinances and the covenants that go after. And this is all very un-Jewish from the later times, because the rabbis got... They have nothing to do with the temple. Remember, I say a rabbi is simply a learned man and nothing else. And uh, so they're without the temple. They haven't had it in a long time. But this all looks back to the temple, and that's why it sounds so unfamiliar. They say, this quaint old sect, what are they doing out there? But they weren't quaint old sects. They were just the regular Jews. Then, uh, and uh, they shall come here to be tried and be tested, and they shall come, uh, well, oh, yes, and they shall not return again from following after the uh, from, uh, from, uh, from following after it, the covenant, you see. May call from any fear or any terror of persecution or any testing by the Mamshelef Bali'al, of any testing of the fire in the government of Satan. Bali'al, you see, in the, the Mamshelef means the government of the ruler of Satan. In the rulers, in other words, they expect persecution. And they said, we cannot. Uh, they have to covenant not to return from any fear or terror or dread of the fire in the, under the prince of this world. And then they say, uh, and then after this is given, it says, and all the people shall join together, all those that hear shall covenant and say uh, after them, after the priests, uh, amen, amen. Then the priests read a, an account of the falling away of Israel and the sins of their fathers. And the, uh, first the priests read a, uh, an account of all the blessings God has bestowed upon them. And this is very much like the coronation of Benjamin talk and so forth. And then the uh, Levites, they read an account of how Israel has gone astray and fallen. And that's why we're here. And they, they're not restoring the gospel. They're waiting for more light and knowledge and for the return of the Savior. Well, the next one is just like, uh, like the beginning of Luke. Remember, we're told that Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth they were priests, of the, they were direct descendants of Aaron, both of them, and they walked perfectly, tamim, you see, uh, teleos, it says teleos, they were walking, walking perfectly after the commandments and so forth. These were the very people to whom the angel came, as he appeared to Zacharias in the temple, and became the father of John the Baptist. And it begins with him, and of course these people were Baptists, and they were baptizing in the desert very near where John the Baptist baptized. Of course, there, some say, well, he belonged to this sect, but it wasn't a sect, there were the other, he had a group of his own out there. And uh, and, this goal, the, uh, uh, and then, well, well, the Hokanim, the Vakrim, and the priest shall bless all, all the men who have accepted the Goral. The Goral is, is your lot, is your government. The Goral is something that you receive by lot, your portion, your inheritance. Everyone has his own. All, the, all those men of the Goral, of, who have the Goral, the, the inheritance of God, uh, and who walk perfectly in the way, the kol dache, in all the ways, walk perfectly in all his ways, were omerim, and they shall say, Yivrach, blessed be thee to all those who uh, do righteous, and so forth and so on. So they bless those who are walking perfectly after the commandments of God. We're told that Elizabeth and her husband walked perfectly in the commandments. You don't find that anywhere else except in the first chapter of Luke. And here it turns up in the Dead Sea Scrolls, where the priest blesses all those who walked perfectly after the commandments and judgments of God. And then, what's another one down here? Ki hachol yachayu b'yachad emeth. Oh, yes. This is the requirements and so forth. Uh, the order of the first law. Everyone must be in his proper place. Uh, in the, well, in the eternal covenant. The eternal covenant. Well, we should go back here and, and start reading. Here we go. Badakath kol ish Israel, and for the knowledge of every man in Israel, every man shall be shall keep himself doctrine and covenant shall keep himself in the office or position which he holds in the church of God. The Yitzis Olami, according to the eternal covenants. Well, uh, and below uh, Yishpol, Ish, and no man shall shuffle, shall be considered, shall go below his office, shall be considered beneath his office, and no man shall place himself above his office. Below uh, Yeramum, which shall place himself above the Makom Gorolo, against above the place to which he has been assigned. But, he says, there is office, but there is no rank. 
Everyone shall be humble, they shall be equal in all things. This emphasis on equality in the Book of Mormon, see, we get this all the way through. Ki hakol yechad v'yechad v'eth. For all are the same as one in the truth, in the church of truth. And they shall, the, in what? Into, for humility and for goodness uh, and for love and for mercy and come uh, shape and for, for righteous thoughts. For makshevet, makshevet tzedek, for the thinking of righteous thoughts. But they shall be equal in these things, and uh, will be these so, and these shall be the sons of an eternal foundation. So they have pretty fancy ideas, the Jews have, and repentance is the theme. Of course, again, the Book of Mormon, it's not mentioned, it's not a, a Jewish theme necessarily. Uh, uh, Ah, yes, here we are. For, ki beruch says, for in the spirit of, of, well, of counsel or the plan. An etzis is the plan or the counsel uh, of the etzis. Uh, see, we got it. Uh, for the, of the true, yes, of the true plan. For in the spirit of the true plan of God are all the ways of a man by which he atones for all his sins, for all his abominations. So they're out to repent and atone. And then it talks about the, the way to perfection and so forth. Uh, and when he returns again, when he returns his soul again to all judgment and righteousness uh, of God, uh, and he shall be purified, and he, his flesh shall be purified with the, from all hitzon, bime nidda, and shall be purified by a washing, this is a washing ordinance, by washing in the waters of Nidda. Now Nidda means washing away of filth, uh, waters of washing. So there's a, and then there shall be a water washing of ba a baptism. At Qumran, one of the most striking things are the pools. There are pools down there, uh, baptismal pools, we thought that, but the Christians who first went there and excavated these, especially Father DeVoe was in charge of the operation there, uh, wouldn't have that at all. Uh, they insisted these were just leather, places for dyeing leather. They are tanks for, for leather processing, because down the way at Ein Feshka there is a leather plant, an ancient leather plant. So that's what it was. But as soon as the Jews took over in 67, they put signs up everywhere, and now you go there and it says, these are the places of baptism. This is where they baptized here, and of course that's what they were. And uh, I remember going through with a, uh, with a doctor who wasn't a member of the church. He was so impressed by that that he got baptized himself. That was the thing that did it, he says. You were right, they, they baptized out here. They did all the same things. The hit kadesh b'mei ducha, and they shall be sanctified in the waters of ducha. Now, duk's a mysterious word, but it's cognate with our dunk. In the waters of dunking, uh, duk, dope, and so forth. Uh, tinchin, tinchin, this means to dunk, to put into the water, and so forth. And uh, our word tint comes from that, incidentally. You, you tint a thing by dyeing it. You see, you, you, you dunk it into the dye, and that's what happens. Well, you wash them in the blood of the Lamb and that sort of thing. And these are the various steps uh, by which they shall go uh, in, on the way of perfection. They use actually the word of perfection. Lehaleketh, uh, lehaleketh tamim, to walk perfectly. Walk perfectly. Bekol darke, in all the ways of God, ka'asher tzuvah, as he has commanded from generation, uh, from dispensation to dispensation. It's always been the same law, and it's a sort of restoration of the gospel they're talking about here. So we go on down. There's uh, very interesting things here. Uh, and Neslamim shall keep of Tevel. Yes, uh, the purifying of, of Enosh, of a, of a person in the government of Tevel, in the room, well, Nemshalath, of course, the government, the rule of Tevel. Tevel is the world down below, the world we're living on here. Tevel is the lower world while we're here and while we're tempted and so forth. Uh, and there are placed before everyone who comes into this world two spirits by which he must walk all the days of his life. And they are for his testing and for his trial. And of course, they're the spirits that, uh, that Moroni talks about in 721. Every man is tempted and enticed by the devil in one direction and tempted and enticed by God in the other direction, and the pull is equal, and it's up to him to make the decision which way he'll go. And this is the doctrine of the two ways it preaches. To every man who comes, there are two spirits, and they accompany him all the days of his life, by which he is to be tested. Which spirit will he, you obey him whom, whom you list to obey? 
So here's the two. And this, uh, this, he says, according to God's plan, which he set up in the beginning, from the beginning. Now, what have we here in Christ? Here's what we've come out for now. Oh, I see your time's up already. Here's what we've come out here. Ele sode ruach lebenei emet. And these are the counsels of the Spirit for the sons of truth while they are on the earth. Wapakuth kol holachei et. And which will be the testing. The pikkuthet. Pikkuthet. that should be pik Well, there's a T on the end, so pakkuthet. They point these things very seriously. Pakkuthet is to test or to a visitation, a testing. Somebody comes and checks up on you and so forth. Uh, the pakkuthet, the tests. Kol uh, holachei. Uh, of all those who walk in this way, and it is for this, for marfe, for healing, l'roshalom, for increase of peace, v'orech yamim, for length of days, zarech im, and for the peruth zarech, and for multiplication of offspring and children. These were not celebrates out here at all, because men, women, children, all buried in the cemetery together. And these, uh, and so, uh, and for length of days, and for peruth zarech, for multiplication of, of offspring or progeny. I'll call Baruchet and all the blessings of eternity. And for joy, the Simcha, with Simcha, or I mean for eternal joy, well, literally the joy of the eternities, the Chaye Nitze, and lives of glory, plural, lives of glory. Nitza, uh, this is Nitzach, Nitzach. It's the same as the Latin word Nitio, to mean shine, to be glorious. Uh, Nitains, shining, brilliant in uh, the high glory, and for a crown of kavod, for a crown of exaltation, greatness exalted, for a crown of exaltation with a middath heder, with a garment of glory. Now, heder is white brilliance, and so forth. With a middath heder, with a garment of glory, ba'or olamim, in the light of the eternities. Now, so they're looking for, and the rabbi will tell you, well, we don't have eternal life, heaven, that's just a philosophical, philosophical concept and so forth. But this is the sort of language we use, isn't it? This is not, uh, this is not Orthodox Judaism. You can see why they didn't want it. It's not Orthodox Christianity either, using this eternal progression thing and getting the crowns and so forth and being tested while you were here. And then we get to the, the pre-existence, the plan as it was made in the beginning. Uh, gosh. And then, well, I see... Well, we're going to go on with the text of the Book of Mormon the next time. There are some things... Well, this is important. Ki ki ban kachar el, for they are the chosen of God. Liberith uh, olamim for an eternal covenant. Wilahem kol kavod Adam, and to them is all the glory of Adam. You see, it's a very. This has upset everybody. They say, well, it means man, but the, it's not ha Adam. It's not the article. There. The glory of Adam is a very interesting thing. That when uh, Jastrow translated, he says, this is all the glory of man. Then in the footnotes in the back, he says, uh, this, this reads the glory of Adam. But of course, we can't accept that because Adam fell and he didn't have any glory. He brought <laughs> death into the world and all our woes. And we don't like Adam. But when this says theirs is all the glory of Adam, it, you can see why they didn't like to publish any more scrolls. They don't want them. They've not been found. You don't read about them. There's not all the excitement about them. But they haven't translated even a fraction of them yet. They don't even know what's there. It's amazing, but they don't like it very much. Well, I see the time's up now. So this is very important for the Book of Mormon. You can see that, because this is the religion of the Book of Mormon. This is the language that Moroni and uh, Nephi use. And I say this was just the beginning. I mean, all of these documents use that particular idiom that particular literary genre, the revelations and the histories and so forth. And it's right out of the out of Lehi's people. Yes, indeed. So we erase these things here. And I'll put this uh, Yadin thing on the reserve. And there are plenty of copies. You can get good paperbacks. You can get Vermes on the Dead Sea Scrolls, or you can get Scrolls of the Dead Sea. There is uh, Dupont Sommet, he has translated the Dead Sea Scrolls. You just look in the uh, in the bookstore. You'll you'll find some good uh, paperback copies of Dead Sea Scrolls there if you want to read them and see how much like the Book of Mormon they are.